Hello, welcome to my video of Black Powder, a beginner's guide looking at epic battle systems, American Civil War from Warlord Games. This is my fourth video of the shooting phase, previous videos, how to construct a force, the basic stat line and the command and movement of the armies. So today I'm going to cover the shooting phase, as I said, I'm also going to look at skirmishes and stamina hits. So shooting phase, I'm going to look at infantry first and then I'm going to cover some special rules for artillery. Now everything's a lot closer than it probably would look being in a battle but that's so I can show off some some of the rules examples on the tabletop later. So shooting phase. First two things, two stats to consider is armament type and the shooting value. Shooting value is quite simple to get your head around and that is going to be a number. It's often going to be three and what that means is when you fire under normal circumstances, you roll three dice. I'll roll three dice there. And it's normally a four to hit. So in that instance, I've got a six, a five, and a one. The one is a miss, we take that away, and we've got two hits with a five or six. The next stat we'll look at is armament type. And this gives you the range and any special rules associated with the weapons you've got. In the American Civil War, the most common type of weapon is a rifled musket. So a rifled musket is the barrel has grooves in it and it fires bullets which are more accurate and have a longer range than smooth bore muskets which have a smooth bore, a smooth inner barrel and fires balls. There is also breech loading weapons so rather than have to load from the muzzle of the gun you're, you're able to put it in the breech which is down near the trigger so they're quicker and easier to load. And repeating, carb uh, repeating rifles and repeating carbines as well. Some cavalry units won't have cavalry rifles or carbines as they're called. They'll have pistols or shotguns. So the basic ranges is if it's a smooth bore musket or carbine, it's got an 18 inch range. If it's, a, if it's rifle, be it breech load and repeating or regular rifle musket, it's got a 24 inch range and pistols and shotguns have got a 6 inch range. Now special rules, breech load and rifles have a high rate of fire. What that represents is you're able to re-roll one of your dice and repeating weapons have a much higher rate of fire and you can re-roll two of your dice. And that's optional whether you do or not, because if you roll a 1 on your re-roll, you've used up your ammunition and you revert to normal type. So a breech loading rifle would just become a, a regular rifled musket for the rest of the battle. Now smooth bores also have a, a special rule called pour it on. And it gives you an extra dice for when you're closing fire, which is when somebody charges you, or close range. Close range is anything within 6 inches. And that represents that smoothbore weapons were easier to fire. You don't have to ram the bullet down a rifled barrel. Now movement does affect your ability to shoot. If you've moved twice or three times in the movement phase, remember a move is a change of formation or a physical move, then you may not fire in the following shooting phase. Okay, so we've discussed range. We now need to discuss how to pick a target. So I'm going to look at this unit here. Now, first up is units have what you call a front arc, which is a front 45 degrees coming out. So if I put the artillery pieces there, you can kind of see how that 45 degrees comes out. Okay. That's called front arc. So you must shoot at the closest visible unit. So visible units are those which are in the front arc. Now there are a couple of exceptions. If it's an artillery piece or a skirmishing unit or it is not clear, you can choose to ignore that. A not clear unit the, means the bulk of it will be in your front arc but not totally... Not, but the bulk it will be in your front arc but the bulk of it won't be in your front arc. So in this instance, this unit here, I'll use a wee pointer, most of that unit is actually more towards the flank, therefore that is not clear. In this instance over here, this unit here, can the artillery is the closest piece, but if they were shooting, they could choose the artillery or choose the unit there. The artillery sh shooting at will be... I'll, I'll come to that in a minute, I won't get ahead of myself. So once you've chosen your target, we work out how many dice you need. 
Basic units have three dice, small units have two, tiny units have one, large units have four. If, like me, you're using three bases per unit, it's quite simple, each base in the u uh, per regular unit, each base would give you one dice. Now this is modified by your formation. A march column formation, remember, is the bases behind each other, don't get any dice. Okay, the attack column formation, which we talked about, doesn't get any bonuses to attack column, but does get some of the negatives, so attack column can only fire with one dice. The other thing that limits the amount of dice is supposing your regiment is occupying a building. So I'll put my church in the middle there. You have three dice. The whole regiment is occupying all of the building. You have three dice to split between sides however you want. You can fire a maximum of two dice from one of the sides. So we know how many dice we roll. So we're going to say we have a line unit. It's a basic 4 plus to hit, but there are some modifications to that. If you're shaken or disordered, it is minus 1 off your dice rolls, so that'll become a 5 to hit. If the target is not clear, so if this unit had chose to shoot at this one, then it would be a further minus 1 to hit. Uh, it would be a minus 1 to hit, which stacks with the shaken or disordered. Also, if you're shooting at artillery or skirmishes, it's minus 1 to hit. Now, if you're at close range, or... Closing fire, you get plus one to hit as well. So in this instance, we have decided to shoot at the unit in front of us. So I've got three dice to hit because I'm in line. I've got fours to hit. We are within six inches. So it's plus one to hit. So instead of four, five, or six, I'm looking at threes, fours, fives, or sixes. So I'm going to roll my dice. And I've got a 6, a 5, and a 2. We discount the 2. The Union Regiment has got 2 hits. It's also got a 6. Now a 6, when you roll to hit, will disorder an enemy unit. Disorder has various effects in game. I've just described it at minus 1 to hit. It also cannot be moved in the movement phase except for uh, retreat by initiative, disorderly retreat. So now we need to look at our morale saves for the for the Union troops. So the basic morale save is at 4+. Plus. You get plus 1 if you're in light cover, which also covers hedgerows, woods, etc. Now I would count that as the Bloody Lane at Antietam, or the defences on day 3 of Gettysburg, where the Union troops were behind the stone walls that the Pickett's Division, Pickett's Division, Pickett's Command charged. You also get plus 2 if you're in buildings or properly heavily defined fortifications. You get minus two if you're caught in march column, minus one if artillery hit you at long range, and minus two if artillery hit you at close or medium range. So in this instance, it would normally be a four, but we are counting this, this cornfield with this picket fence as light cover, so we'll give them plus one. So on the three or more, we ignore the stamina hit. So I'm gonna roll my dice, and I've got a one and a three. So the three cancels one of the hits out, and the one goes through, the Union Regiment takes one stamina hit. Now stamina. Actually, before we move into stamina, I will point out one other thing, which is called enfilade fire. So if you're firing down the length of a regiment, for example like this, you could re-roll any of your misses for free. So in this instance, I'll roll my three dice, and hypothetically, I've got two misses. I get to re-roll them again. The same is true. It has to be down the length of a regiment. So if I was shooting down from the front of a, of a regiment in March column, that would count as enfilade as well. So I'll put these back. And we'll talk a bit about stamina. So stamina hits accumulate throughout the game. A unit with no hits is caught, described as being fresh, so those occasions where a unit is fresh and the rules crop up, that's what that means. If a unit he hits its stamina, in this case it's a, a regular unit stamina 3, that is then called shaken. So any rules which affect shaken units start to affect them as well. So a shaken unit basically cannot charge and is minus 1 when it's shooting. Over the course of a turn, you may accumulate more hits than you do stamina. 
You record them until the end when you need to take brake tests. The more hits you take, the more likely you are to fail that brake test. Once all that's done, you will default back down to the, the, the your brake point, your stamina. So if you're stamina three and you were a five stamina at the end of the turn, once your brake test is taken, you would go back down to stamina three. There are other ways if, you, if you've got stamina hits, there are ways that you can reduce stamina hits. Now it's worth noting that stamina represents more than just casualties. It represents both losses, dead and wounded, as well as fatigue, expenditure of ammunition, loss of nerve, as well as the X factor. And the X factor for me are those things that occur to a unit you cannot account for. And it's a bit of an abstraction and different troops will respond to different things differently as the battle unfurls. So that is basic shooting and stamina. We now talk about skirmishes. In black powder, there are two ways we use skirmishes. First one is every regular unit can adopt a formation known as mixed order. So again, that's a move to, to form. And what mixed order does is allows you to put one of your stands forward as skirmishes. You might even have a specific stand you swap out to represent skirmishing to remind yourself but in most games i'll adopt my mixed formation like that and what that represents is in the american civil war your regiments had 10 companies and they were trained for two companies to be forward skirmishing and what skirmishes did was hold off enemy units and and you'd have a mini firefight in front of your regiments. You'd have six regiments in the line of battle and you'd have two in reserve, able to be deployed by the regimental commander as required. The benefit is that when you're shooting at a unit with mixed order and skirmishes out front, they're minus one to be hit. The drawback is you can only fire with one dice and that's from the skirmishes because the rest of the line won't fire for fear of hitting their own skirmishes. If they charge, or receive a charge, the skirmishes are simply returned back to the parent unit. I found once we get close into battle, I'd rather have the rolling the three dice for shooting than have the skirmishes out. For most of my Napoleonic armies, for example, I've created special skirmishing stands for units, but generally I don't use them that often. Now a unit may have a special rule, which means they're skirmishers, or in Black Powder Glory Hallelujah, one regiment per brigade can be designated light infantry. And that means the whole regiment can adopt the skirmish formation. The advantages of that is it's obviously harder to hit for skirmishers. It's easier to pass through terrain. But often you may have, because you're taking up more space, you might have less shots available. So in that instance, this regiment is skirmishing, these two units could fire, so they would get two dice if it was firing, because this one is obscured. And designated skirmishing units as well tend to be tiny or small. Badan sharpshooters tend to be a good example. In most combat, skirmishers have a minor role to play, a valuable but minor role to play, so most commanders will have more troops in their line regiments. Now artillery. Artillery have... First up, their stats. It, they'll often have three numbers. For example, regular artillery has three, two, one. Three is the amount of dice to get close range, which is up to six inches. Two is medium, which is up to half their maximum range. And the one would be long range, which is from half to their full range. And there's two types of artillery in the American Civil War. First up, was the ones what they called Napoleons, which were smooth bores. Uh, you can see here, I painted this bronze so it stands out, and they've got a 48 inch range. So the second one they started developing and using a lot more was a rifled, which is known as a parrot, and that's what a parrot looks like, and that had a longer range on it as well, and that is 60 inches. Now, artillery have a special rule in that they can fire over, if this artillery battery was deployed way back here, they can fire over 
friendly units. As long as there's six inches between the artillery and the friendly unit and six inches at the target beyond. So artillery on the firing, if the firing at, at a column, be that march or attack column, the plus one to hit. If they're firing at long range, they're minus one to hit. And if they're firing overhead, they're minus one to hit. So in this instance, if this unit was firing at this unit, it's overhead fire. So it's minus one to hit. So instead of normal force to hit, it's going to become fives to hit. And it's medium range, so we don't suffer the penalty from long range. And they're in line column, so I don't suffer any penalties, uh, any get any bonus for shooting at column. So fives to hit, two dice at medium range. I've got a six, which disorders the unit. Now, when you take a morale saves, I said before, with if you get hit by artillery at long to medium, you're minus two to your morale. That's so close to medium, you're minus two to your morale. So instead of four, five, six. So I take my morale test, I need a six to save it. I've got a one, so the Confederate unit would take a stamina hit. Artillery also, if you hit by artillery and take artillery hits, that will affect your stamina more as well. Uh, so it's not stamina, your break tests more as well at the end, and I'll cover that in the morale phase. My experience with artillery is it's underwhelming at long range, but deadly at close range. Often at long range, it's quite hard to keep clear lines of fire for it, so you, you're firing at long range, overhead, there's a lot of penalties up there. But at close range, what they do is put a lot of dice on a smaller frontage. So, for example, if you were attacking this formation here, well, this unit here with their longer frontage, you've got three dice. With a much shorter frontage, that artillery battery there would also have three dice. So that gives you a lot of benefits for defense, especially with the morale penalties at minus two when you take the morale saves from being hit at close to medium range from artillery. The other thing for long range artillery is you, black powder generally, you, games don't run long enough for you to have a grand battery just plumbing away at the enemy at long range to cause damage to build up. Now the rules, we'll talk about a battery, a glory hallelujah supplement, and again they're 3 two, one Generally that represents a four gun battery from the American Civil War, and that would be represented with two artillery pieces. Now if it's a six gun battery that will have a better stat line and that would be either a five or a four, two and one and I'll use three models for that. I'll also have artillery limbers so I can indicate whether they're limbered. Now if my limber is touching the artillery piece, so you've got to imagine I don't have a limber to hand at the moment, artillery piece and this is the limber, if they're touching like that that means the artillery piece is being transported by the limber if the artillery piece is deployed, I will leave the limber a slight distance away to show that the limbers aren't carrying the artillery. What that also does is shows you in the battlefield that artillery batteries actually took up less space on the width, but a lot of space in the depth when you start thinking about the horses to carry the limb, to draw the limbers, to draw the Cassians, etc. And a lot of manpower actually went into artillery batteries as well. So much so, I think it was either the Antietam or the Gettysburg campaign, I forget which. Lee had so much artillery that he didn't want to take it. So he actually sent some batteries into static defences. He'd much rather have the, inf uh, the manpower used in the batteries in his infantry regiments. But the states were providing batteries and regiments, so he had less fingertip control over how his army was built. But anyway, that's the end of the video for today. I've covered shooting, modifiers for shooting, how you determine your dice, stamina, how that builds up. We've looked at skirmishes and the effects of skirmishing in the shooting phase. And we've also looked at artillery there. My next video I'm going to do is going to be hand-to-hand -hand combat. If you have any questions from the video I've done today, do fire them up. I do like answering questions. I do love talking about wargaming. If you do like what you've seen, once I've done the beginner's guide, I'm going to be doing other videos about the epic battle system and the American Civil War, so do subscribe. Also seeing subscriptions knows that I'm doing something right as well, and that's always good to see. But that's bye for now, and I'm hoping you're going to have a great day. Goodbye.